It is by going down into the abyss that we recover the treasures of life. Where you stumble, there lies your treasure. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Some of you may recall that I've avoided doing a lot of reviews on Fate-powered games, beyond the two that I already did. Part of that is because I don't think I could handle them in a unique way, when the main point of critique I'd have with Fate's mechanics would result in me repeating myself. I've consistently had issues with two things, the stunt-slash-refresh mechanic, especially during character creation, and the aspect system. Now, it's the latter that I wish to focus on, since the idea of a descriptor-based mechanic is not a bad idea on its own. My problem is when a dividing line between a good aspect and a bad aspect isn't made clear. Some of you might say that should be a GM call, but I think relying on the GM in such a way is a bandage at best. I could go into how you shouldn't assume a level of GM experience, but that's a topic for another day. The point is, when descriptors can potentially be anything, you can create choice paralysis and or overpowered descriptors, since players will always be on the lookout to see how far they can push it. That brings me to today's subject matter, Not the End. Created by Claudio Pustorino, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, and published by Fumble GDR alongside Mana Project Studio, Not the End utilizes a descriptor-based system they call Hexis, as well as being purportedly built on three pillars. One. Take risks for what you consider important. 2. Let your story change your hero. 3. Live every end like a new beginning. It's these three pillars that'll serve as the foundation I'll judge this game of heroic fiction on. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I will note that I did back the game on Kickstarter, and I've had people from Fumble GDR on the show. As always, this will not play a factor into my assessment. With all that said, how does Not the End hold up in my temple? Let's find out. Not the End runs at 240 pages, but it really doesn't feel like it. I suppose the major reason why is the writing is fairly spaced and not all that dense. It has a very art book or coffee table-like feel with plenty of full page and spread art that presents many genres, and I'd describe it almost like film. I'd hesitate to use the word cinematic, as that's been done to death at least three times over. However, a lot of the art is reminiscent of concept art that one would see in a fantasy or science fiction film. I do appreciate the inclusion of bookmarks and hyperlinks as well, though I noticed a few of them were still in Italian on my copy. I know translation isn't an easy process, so I don't plan on making too much of a stink about it. I will, however, have to dock points for the lack of an index. I gotta maintain my consistency. Character creation is, on paper, extremely simple. We'll be diving into it once again with Aldine Zabak robinson in a three-step process. Now, after describing the character in one sentence, we start to fill in the hexes regarding the character, known collectively as traits. The first of these is archetype, which is the core aspect of the character and goes right in the center. This can be a race, a profession, both, an iconic phrase, or something else entirely. Now, in our case, we'll go with Winter Countess. Secondly are qualities, which occupy the first ring of the character sheet. We'll start with three that are meant to represent the most significant characteristics. In our case, we'll go with charismatic, noblewoman, and experienced. Thirdly is abilities, important things that a character can do. We start with four of these, and these are usually some sort of action that the character is known for. These can also be skills, powers, talents, you get the idea. In our case, we'll go with tactics, swordsmanship, winter magic, and diplomacy. Fourth is resources, which are broadly viewed as things at the character's disposal, but not necessarily limited to equipment. We can have between three to five resources, with one of them treated as rare for the purposes of the story. In our case, we have Noble's Clothing, Cape, Official Seal, and Ice Wings as our rare resource. Now, while that technically covers everything, I want to point out that at each phase, there are examples, suggestions, and guidelines for traits to help guide players. That said, it's still advisable to have the GM list off suggested traits, qualities, abilities, and resources. I absolutely love how out of the way the book goes in giving examples, even doing multiple characters to make the process as easy as possible. There's always going to be some choice paralysis, but this is a good way of minimizing it. However, we're not quite done with hero creation, as I feel I need to cover some of the advanced rules. Now, this is listed in the advanced hero creation part of the book, and right out of the gate has a at-your-own-risk vibe, since it's best to be familiar with the character creation rules before that's even done. These advanced rules take the following form. First, the hero learns a lesson. This is recommended for those familiar with the lesson advancement system, which is a kind of card-based approach, and basically has a lesson effect replace a trait. Two, the hero has suffered misfortunes. Misfortunes are negative traits that can be applied at the start instead of during play. Three, the hero has more than eight traits. This is basically the equivalent of starting a character with a higher base in other games. 
It's recommended that the starting amount of traits is the same for all players if this option is taken. And five, the hero is marked with a scar. A scar is another possibility of a negative trait, or the end of something important to them. This option has them start with a scar, replacing a trait on the sheet. Basically, a dead hex. All in all, there's a decent amount of customization, but the GM will have to pitch in since this is a universalist game. I've covered games that use dice, cards, and plenty of other randomizers. This is a first for me, though, because Hexus is token-based. Any roll is based on filling a bag of tokens that are positive or negative. Regardless of what's in the bag, the intent is to have one positive and one negative type. I've personally used stones from the Go set that I have, but checkers pieces might work just as well for you. When making a test, you first describe the goal, and then you insert as many positive pieces in the bag as the traits applicable to the test, and the GM places negative pieces into the bag based on the difficulty of the task. Afterward, you draw one to four pieces from the bag at once. You can keep what you drew, or you can choose to take a risk and draw more, up to a total of five. Once this is done, you spend the positive pieces to add degrees of success, and the negative pieces are used by the GM to create complications. I like to describe this dichotomy as yes and but, respectively. If you have at least one positive piece drawn, the test is considered a success. Further positive pieces can be used to add additional degrees of success, or to strengthen a trait by banking one onto a trait, to allow that trait to count twice when applicable in a future test. Negative pieces do not cancel positive ones per se. They add complications to the result, generate misfortunes on the player, or activate the adrenaline or confusion conditions if appropriate. There's no health system per se, but instead a test has a danger level, which determines how many negative pieces cause you to leave the scene. For example, if a test is fairly dangerous, you exit the scene when you draw three or more negative pieces. Lastly, in advancement you gain the lessons or scars, as I hinted at earlier. Now a scar can be used to bank a negative piece when it is drawn, but it does take up a trait slot. Lessons, conversely, allow a hero to utilize tests in a new way. While the lessons in the book are separated by theme, they can be randomly drawn if needed, since lessons are intended to be on cards. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention The End in a game called Not The End. This takes two forms. One is the end of a trait, which is typically how scars are generated, and the other is the hero's end, which keeps reminding me of raising the death flag from previously covered Heavens and Heresies. Facing the end is a test with the largest amount of freedom, with positive pieces allowing the player to recount positive events or granting a trait to another hero. Negative pieces can be used to grant a scar or a lesson to symbolize how the hero's end affects someone. Additionally, these resources do not have to be spent immediately. They could be saved for later on in the story if one wished. But speaking of stories, I want to spend some time talking about the settings present in the book. Not the End spends a lot of time going into how to create a setting for it. This is similar to some elements of character creation, but there's no sheet. Now the details of the system are as follows. The first is describing the setting in one sentence, much like you do for characters, i.e. the general idea, the where, and the when. Second, the necessary details, essentially fill in the blanks for the story to a point. It's also noted to consider frequency of sessions for the duration. Third is to create examples of traits, resources, and names. This is self-explanatory, but having a set of bullet points for players is crucial. The rest of this chapter is dedicated to example settings, and I'd like to skim through each of them. First is Die Krogner Akademie, a Weird War I mixed with a magic military school. Singapore, a cyberpunk Singapore that's being swallowed up by the rising sea. Knights of the Round, Mecha meets Arthurian Cycle. Remember this one for later. Red Creek, a Wild West town named after the river running through it. And The Round Table, a different take on the Arthurian cycle that doubles down on the fairy tale like elements a la Mists of Avalon. Good book, by the way. Each of these possesses multiple materials, suggestions, and a few sample hexis spreads. The latter is especially important for putting it all into practice. I sometimes use or abuse the term elephant in the room. The reason the phrase is a thing is because elephants are big and hard to ignore. Not the end has one that's either going to make or break your enjoyment of it. The token-based mechanic for tests. This might be a hard sell based on the disposition of your table, and even more so if your table is more virtual than physical. I personally like how much the game doubles down on risk-reward, almost making it a game of chicken. Still, it's clear that the game skews more towards physical than virtual-style tabletop. Granted, there are those in the community who have tried to make interactive sheets to run virtual, but I'd hesitate to say it would be easy to run this game on a virtual tabletop like Roll20. 
Beyond that, I think comparing it to most traditional TTRPGs, or even most universal-style TTRPGs, isn't exactly accurate. I'd say, if anything, it has the most in common with previously reviewed Everway, in the sense that it's less concerned with pass or fail and more with how the randomizer advances a shared narrative. I talked about this briefly when I did the Valley of the Judge episode on the Quick Start edition of the Cowboy Bebop RPG, which uses a modified version of Hexis, but I feel like this approach of de-emphasizing pass and fail and emphasizing the shared narrative is a good way to teach people how to actually roleplay. Now, I said I'd judge it based on the early pillars, so I have to answer to whether or not the game lives up to them. I would say all three apply. The core mechanic is already accounted for, the game wants the story to be key to evolution instead of evolution being laid out, and the end is treated with a degree of gravitas that may still affect the story after it happens. Even with the hurdle of its core mechanic, I'd give Not the End a stamp of strongly recommended. I can see why this game won the accolades it did in its native Italy, even winning RPG of the Year at one point, and there's a crazy amount of potential I can see within its rules as it's easy to visualize setting hacks for this particular system. This is something where I want to see how far people can take it in the same way I love seeing how far modders can take certain video games, even if in some cases the modders end up being the gameplay. Remember folks, never trust Todd Howard. And of course, that's not even getting into the stories expansion, which presents another batch of settings to play around with, but it goes to show that there's a high amount of potential within this system. It's in that potential that makes me believe we'll be seeing something interesting when that Cowboy Bebop TTRPG that fumbles the GDR is involved comes around. But in the meantime, I'd like to look at a more recent hack of the Hexis system. Stay frosty!